Welcome. It is so great to see all of you again. It has been such a long time, but I'm excited that we are back. Orly Waba here, founder of Abraham's Legacy and Natila. And I'm very excited to be joining you for a pre-Purim event. Uh, lots of exciting things happening over the course of this week with Purim, and we're, I'm excited for our guest speakers tonight. It's good to see those of you that are joining for the first time. Welcome. So excited to have you. Uh, just before we get started, a few thank yous. I want to thank Shoval, who is helping us on the tech side of things. I'd also like to thank my partner in all of this, Naomi Jerno from Naomi's Uplifting Events. I love you, and I'm so excited to be working with you time and time again on these incredible uh, talks, inspiring talks. And of course, I want to thank each and every one of you. It's so good to see your faces, so many faces that I've come to love and to know. And those of you that are new, I'm excited to get to know you uh, as well. So I want to thank you for choosing to be here because I know that you could be choosing to do anything else with your time. And of course, above all, the number one thank you goes out to Hashem for giving me the opportunity to continue doing this. As you know, I, I continue saying this and it's very true. Hashem is the CEO and I just happen to work for him. So I'm very excited to have that uh, opportunity to be working for him. We have an exciting agenda for you tonight. I want to mention that tonight's program is sponsored is dedicated to Nishma, my grandfather, Avraham Ben Polin, Alava Shalom. If anyone is interested, we're going to continuously have these events. Uh, every month, we're going to be doing events through Abraham's Legacy and through Natila. And Bezrat Hashem, we're going to uh, gear up to do another, uh, you know, another 40 days like we did back in the summertime going into the Chagim. Bezrat Hashem, I really hope to do so. So if anybody is interested, if you want to sponsor an event in memory or in honor of a loved one, feel free to always reach out to me. As I mentioned, tonight is in memory of Avraham Ben Polin. So let me just tell you a little bit about our agenda for tonight, and we're going to jump right in so we can hear our incredible speakers. First, we're going to be hearing from our amazing speakers that are going to be speaking about Purim, be speaking about this incredible mitzvah of Netilat Yadayim and its relevance into our life so that we can uh, you know, bring this mitzvah to a whole other level. And after those talks, I'm going to share a little bit about Netila as well. We're going to be doing a Tehillim read through the Abraham's Legacy Tehillim app. It's very easy to get a hold of it if you don't have the app already downloaded on your phone. Super simple. All you do is you go to the App Store, whether you have an Android phone or if you have an iPhone, you can go ahead to that App Store and download Abraham's Legacy. It's a free app. It will always be free. As I mentioned, I created this app in memory of my grandfather. And what it does is it allows all of us to continuously to read the book of Tehillim in unison within minutes. And so we're going to be doing a Tehillim read for six minutes. And hopefully Bezrat Hashem not only finish one book, maybe we'll be able to finish two books of Tehillim in unison. Uh, so please feel free to download it. It's in Hebrew, English, Spanish, and French. So if you don't have it, you can still get it until we do the Tehillim read. At that point, we're going to do our Tehillim read for six minutes. And you don't want to go anywhere after that because we're going to be doing two raffles today. And the beautiful thing about the raffles for the Natila Cup today is that it's going to be two Natila Cups that are engraved with the Baracha of Natila Tiyadayim. Absolutely beautiful. I wish I had it here. I'm going to pick it up first thing tomorrow, but I'm, I'm excited to be sending those off. For those of you that are interested in getting your own 100% pure copper Natila Cup, we have a very uh, special discount, a coupon code with the, the code PURIM, that you can utilize that from now until next Sunday, until March 20th, to be able to grab your Natila cup or perhaps even gift one forward to a friend or to a loved one, especially with uh, Pesach coming up. It's a, it's a very opportune time to do so. Uh, so again, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our first speaker. And I, you know, I have to tell you that he's most certainly impacted me. He doesn't even know how much he's impacted me. Rabbi Laser Brody. He was born in Washington, D.C. in 1949. He's a graduate of the University of Maryland uh, at College Park, where he studied agriculture, and he moved to Israel in 1970. And that's when he joined Israeli Defense Forces. And he spent 19 years, 19 years, in regular and reserve army combat services before becoming a military chaplain, a position he held until his discharge from the IDF after 29 years of service. He's a graduate of the Eshat Torah Rabbinical Seminary in Yerushalayim. And Rabbi Brody holds rabbinical ordinations from Rabbi Noah Weinberg of Eshat Torah in Jerusalem, Rabbi Yitzchak Kulitz, the head rabbi of Jerusalem, Dayan Natan Kupshitz from Jerusalem, and Rabbi Zalman Chamya Goldberg Shlita from Yerushalayim. He's the author of The Trail to Tranquility, 
The Path to Your Peak, and many other books in Hebrew and English. Rabbi Brody is also the English translator of the worldwide best-selling Garden of Emunah, Garden of Peace, and the Garden of Gratitude. Absolutely incredible books. He's dubbed the voice of Emunah by Israel National Radio and a former show host there. He's sought after as an inspirational and motivational speaker who speaks to audiences of all backgrounds, both in Israel and also abroad, as well as a renowned spiritual guide and life coach. In addition to his rich background as a soldier, a farmer, a rabbi, and spiritual guide, he's a certified personal fitness trainer and health coach with ACCT and expert rating certifications with unique holistic approach to health of body, mind, and soul. Laser Beams, Rabbi Brody's award-winning daily web journal, and I'll place the link here shortly, that has been on the web for over a decade and a half has now morphed into Emunah Beams, and it's built around his podcast of Emunah and encouragement that people around the globe enjoy daily. And so it is my honor and my pleasure to be able to introduce Rabbi Laser Brody, who's going to be speaking on the topic of Nitilatia Daim and the Purim connection. Rabbi Brody, thank you so much for being here. Orly, I got stuttered after such an intro. <laughs> Boy, I'm blushing and stuttering, but we're going to get, get rid of that. And Hashem, Hashem's loving grace, we are going to learn about the most underrated mitzvah in Torah, the mitzvah Natilas Yadayim. Now, if I ask you, if we open it up to the Rebbe Shema Bar Yochai says right in the beginning of the Zohar that Hashem looked inside the Torah and Hashem created the world because the Torah, Hashem wrote it way before he created the world. This was his blueprint. We know that an architect, first he makes a blueprint and then he hands it to, to the engineer. In this situation, Hashem is both the architect and the engineer. So if we ask ourselves, what is the connection between what's going on now and the war between Russia and Ukraine and Adar and the Purim is this week and Attila Yadaim and Moshe and Amalek and Mordechai and Esther and Haman, it's all one connection. And you're not going to believe this, but we'll hear this tonight. And it was unbelievable when I got the invitation from Orly. I said, this is, this is crazy. Because I, I had this crazy thought about Natilis Yadaim. And then here, he made this Kenneth. This is, I think Orly got a, a, a Holy Spirit, a Ruach HaKodesh, when, when she planned this. And Bo Hashem should be successful. And Hashem should be with us. And everything we say should be absolute MS and should be help everyone to get closer to Hashem. And how do we get closer to Hashem? We get closer to Hashem in two ways. We strengthen our Muna and we strengthen our Kedusha. And the Tilas Yadayim is good for both. Okay, so let's start. We said the Torah is a blueprint from all time. This connection. Now, we'll go back to the war between Moshe Rabbeinu and Amalek, the war between Amalek and Yisrael. Okay, it didn't start. The war with Amalek didn't start. Just Amalek. We said it Shabbat Shor, that we wipe out the memory of Amalek. It's not with Mordechai and Esther. We go back to Moshe, that when the Jewish people came out of Egypt and were on the way to receiving Torah, and we're at Rifidim, Rifidim, where do we get the name Rifidim? The Midrash tells us, Rafu Yadem. Their hands became weak. What their hands became weak? Rafu Yadem. What, what their hands became weak? Okay, their Muna became weak. Their legs became weak. Ayefi Yagea, they're tired. Why their hands became weak? As soon as someone's hands become weak, that is a metaphor that his amuna is weak. Because how did Moshe win the war? Amalek was Amalek was winning and didn't know what to do. Yoshua said, Moshe said, pick our best soldiers, pick the commandos. He said the best commandos, the best strike forces, and they weren't beating Amalek. Moshe says, wait, well, something's going wrong here. I can't beat a Moloch, not with military tactics and not with arms. And it doesn't matter that all our soldiers are black belts, uh, 32 degree black belts. Moshe Rabbeinu, he said to Aaron and Hur, help me get up the mountain. Moshe was already <laughs> older. And he climbed up the mountain and he looked at the battlefield of the mountain. And then what he did, he raised his hands. And the Torah says, And the hands of Moshe became a Munah. So what does Onkelos tell us? Uncle says, Emunah, please. He says in Aramaic, he says, Moshe's hands were outspread in prayer. Now, just see, cherry sisters, what do you do when you want to talk to Shem and you're alone? Nobody sees what you're doing and you really want to ask for something and you can't talk. No one, woman or man, can talk with their hands tied by their back. 
you're, you're talking, you right away, your hands go up. And this is the, the sign that a person is talking to Hashem. Anytime you see a picture, a person in meditation, deep in talking to Hashem, his hands are outspread. That's for Yehi Yadav Emunah. Why do you talk to Hashem? Why do you pray to Hashem? What's effective communication with Hashem when you believe in Hashem? Then you speak to him. So that way, Moses, he won the war. He won the war because when his hands were upraised, the Israelites were gaining. And when his hands dropped, they became tired. Then Amalek gained the upper hand. What are the hands? Hands, we see the Torah, the Torah condemns us when it says, As soon as a person thinks his biceps, his triceps, and his fist, that's his power. Oh, you're wrong. Uh, young man, you're Jewish. Young lady, you're Jewish. Your power is in your emunah. And it's right here from the war of Amalek that is still going on now. We're going to go all through, through Purim, through Persia, Mordechai and Esther, up here. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Excuse me if I speak a little bit fast, but uh, we don't want to take up more time than what's allotted. So Moshe Rabbeinu, he raises his hands in emunah. But now what if we go and what the Torah says about Amalek? What did Amalek do to us? The Torah doesn't give any record of fatalities, heaven forbid, of casualties, heaven forbid, but the Torah says what Amalek did. You've got the spiritual fatigue. You want somebody's spiritual, emotional fatigue, emotional fatigue. He doesn't feel like doing anything. That's Amuna. Amuna is the cheshek. And when it gives you the desire, do something, the desire to get close to Hashem. So how do you get that? Where, do you, where does that Amuna come from? Ooh, okay. So first of all, we know that, oh, another thing that Amalek did, he said, Amalek's entire war, his strategy was to cool down the Amuna. Look at who he attacked. Here's Am Yisrael coming out of Egypt. You know what they all saw? The Navi says that the crossing, crossing the Red Sea, they saw what Yechezkel the prophet didn't see. Yechezkel the prophet that predicts the third Beit of Migdash. He gives a prophecy of third bait of make that. That's what it's going to look like. But this, the simplest man, the simplest woman, the simplest child coming out of Egypt, they saw what Yechazel didn't see. And all of a sudden, the Malik, boom, pulls down their Muna. What happened to the 10 plagues? What happened to the splitting Red Sea? Where did that all go? Where did it go? Okay, that's a Malik. That's the power of Malik. A Malik attacks a Muna. And he's doing that right now. Rabbi Nachman Abreslav said, in our generation, I'm fast forward, we'll go back. He said, in our generation, the entire war of Gog and Magog, it's not Russia and Ukraine, and he foresaw that. Now, we read Nachman foresee that. The Gona Vilna foresaw that. And the Gona Vilna told us that when the Russians take over Crimea, then get your Mashiach's clothes ready. And when the Russians go to Istanbul, then that means Mashiach is already here. So there are talks about maybe peace talks in Istanbul. Now they will move to Jerusalem. Oh, now Yechezka the prophet says that when the leaders of the nation that come to Jerusalem, they're going to have an excuse to, an excuse to attack Jerusalem. Then the, the race of Migdash is already here. We see all these things coming down right now. But it all goes back to Amalek. Rabbi Nachman says, the emuna in this generation is like climbing a glass wall with your fingertips. Everybody is telling you there's no emuna. There's so much fake news, social media, and CNN, and, and, and this one, and that one, and BBC, and I don't know what, what other they're called, Wall Street Journal and New York Times. Everybody is saying, no Hashem, no Hashem. So we have to complain to them. The Israeli government, they're doing the same thing too, because uh, they're not on their emuna agenda. And that's why we pray for Malchus based David. We pray for them. They say, oh, they, they, call, they, they, they call us the Meshichistim. Why? And any, any believing Jew that says, Shmonai say, it's Semach David Adacham Mehret Hatzmiach. We're all praying for it. But that is the war. That is the war. The war is against the Malik. So a Malik, who is a Malik? A Malik is the grandson of Asaph, and he's the great grandfather of Haman. Okay, so a Malik was defeated, but he wasn't wiped out. And in every generation, that's why Milchamala Amalek Dor Dor. We said, we had a white pot, Amalek, that's the job of each one of us. Each one of us, we can't wait, not for the IDF and, and not for any organization and not for the rabbinical council. It is the job of every single one of us to defeat Amalek. Now, how are we going to defeat Amalek? We're going to defeat Amalek. You're not going to believe this. Okay, but everything is recorded. And I hope Rebbe Sinorli sent me a copy of the recording. Okay, we're going to defeat Amalek. Guess how? 
not with mortars, not with conventional weapons, with an unconventional weapon, and it's not nuclear power, it's greater than nuclear power, it's the mitzvah of Natilas Yadayim. Oh, and I said, what's this? Hey, what's this? What's, what's Rabbi Laser smoke? Never smoke. Rebson only told you I, I'm an athlete and a coach, never smoke. No. But he said, what do you think? And no substance, very clean. Okay. I, I drink uh, wet red wine on Shabbos. I love red wine, but that, that, that's it. Like, this for Natila, is he dying? That's going to bring us Mashiach? That's going to defeat Amalek? It certainly is. It certainly is. Moshe Rabbeinu raised his hands and the Torah says, that his hands were emunah. That's so inspired. David Melech. David Melech, what did he write? If we open up to heal him, Kuf Lamed Dalit, David Melech says, Kodesh, Hashem. Carry your hands in holiness and bless Hashem. So, wait a second, what does David Melech mean? Suyadechem Kodesh. He says, Suyadechem Kodesh. He says, it doesn't say Suyadechem Bekdusha, if you know Hebrew, carry your hands in holiness. He says, carry your hands, they're holiness. How can David Melech say that the hands are holiness? To understand David Melech, you have to go back to Torah and learn Parshas Pekudin. When the Torah talks about the copper basin that the Kohanim would wash their hands and their feet from, and the mitzvah that the Kohanim, they're not allowed to go and do ritual sacrifices, none of their ritual jobs, the Levim, before they sing, they have to wash their hands. Everybody's going to wash their hands. And where they do it, they do it on the copper basin. They wash their hands. And once they wash their hands, the hands become holiness. The hands are holy. Washing the hands in the prescribed ritual manner turns his hands into holiness. And this is what King David says, So now our holy Tanoim in the Gemara and Tractate Brochot said, let's understand what King David said, that they gave it in, in a Mishnah about the law of Natilas Yadayim, but they didn't explain. Then comes along the Amorayim and the Gemara, and they explain, you know what David Melech is talking about? David Melech is talking about that when we wash our hands for bread, we have to wash them just like the Kohanim did in the Beit HaMikdash. And what we do when we wash our hands, which now we just finished, dun -da -dun 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 -da, one, two, one, two, one, two. Bring out the bread, okay? <laughs> what do they say? People say, I've got a quick bracha to Hashem. Rub a dub dub, thanks for the grub. Yay, Hashem. No, it's not what we do. Slow in that. We wash our hands and we contemplate Hashem. Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid, like the King David says. We see Hashem before us always. So uyadechem koidish. We carry our hands up. So uyadechem koidish. And what does the Torah say? Vayehi yadav emunah. The Torah says in single tense, but and it came to pass single that Moses' hands, plural, are emunah. Uh, excuse me, Torah doesn't know grammar. Why is the Torah mixing genders? It uses single and plural. Our pages tell us that when we held our hands together, it's like one power of emunah. And we hold the right a little bit higher than the left because the right is chesed, divine mercy, and the left is stern judgment, and we subjugate the stern judgment to Hashem's mercy, and we carry our hands and we bless Hashem, we bless Hashem for the mitzvahs that we love. The mitzvahs we love, we're talking about it, this is not what we're doing right now. So what's going on here? Rabbi Nachman explains something that the Arizal says. Rabbi Nachman says, what's the whole purpose of raising our hands? Okay, wash your hands. Halacha requires wash the hands. Halacha doesn't say raising the hands. Raising the hands, talk about the Zohar, the Arizal, the, the esoteric Torah. What goes on then? Rabbi Nachman says, when we raise our hands after we wash them, then Hashem permeates emuna into our hands. It's not enough we have emuna. I'm a good Jew in my heart. I'm a good Jew in my head. No, we have to be a good Jew in our hands because our hands are holiness. Look at this with the poor. One of our mitzvahs in Purim is giving to the poor. Matana sevyonim. Look at the person that gives something begrudgingly. Gives a, Do you know what the rabbis do? The real tzaddikim? Before they give tzedakah, they wash their hands because they want to bring a moon into their hands. Once you've got a moon in your hands, say, hey, wait a second. This money, it's not mine, it's Hashem's. I'm partnering with Hashem and giving to the poor person. It's not just me. So 
with Amuna. That's just like Moshe Rabbeinu fighting Amalek. So if that gave the power to Moshe Rabbeinu and to the Holy Israelite army, it's going to give each one of us the power to fight Amalek. So when a person doubts, is that really a sham? Is that really a, what would have been a sham? Yes, it is. We know that Shem is, and the Siva Voloshin says something even more. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu keep his hands up for three hours? Amalek, his whole strategy was nature, his military strategy. Amalek was also a master astrologist, and he looked into the stars. When is the exact hour that he can defeat Moshe and the Israelites? You know what happened when Moshe Rabbeinu lifted his hands? Hashem stopped the sun dead in its tracks. The sun did not move for three hours. Amalek was completely disoriented. The sun's not moving. The stars are not moving for three hours. That upsets the whole astrology. Amalek, that he's depending on the, uh, the stars and the sun to tell him what to do. He doesn't know what to do. And that's me, Yidav Amuna. And then at that point, the Jews attacked with Amuna and slaughtered him. And then they killed. That's our power over a Malik. Well, we use a Muna. And the Nitziv of Velozhin says it's not, it's not the power. It's the power that what wrote Moses what to do for all generations is to show that the power of Emuna and Hashkocha Pratis, Hashem's divine direction, this overrides and trumps out nature and, and its strategy and everything. And we can see things that are obvious things are surprising, surprising history right now, where you know, the David, the Goliath, and People understand who would believe in this generation uh, through history was the greatest anti-Semitic nation in the world, not the Nazis, Ukraine. I know I'm a Ukrainian Jew. I take care of my, my great grandparents, the grave site in, in Yanov, right near Vinitsa now, not gonna be going there in the near future. But uh, there, there's a, a, a two communal graves next to where my great grandparents are. They're from 1942 and 1944, 1,500 Jews that Hitler killed, and, and another 2,500 Jews. Well, there was the one in 1942, there were eight Nazi soldiers on the train, and this whole town of Yanov, how did they gather up all these Jews? <laughs> the, the, the Ukrainians told them. Now here, look what the Mashiach is. Not only in this anti-Semitic country, we have a Jew that's the president of Ukraine, and they're attacked by Russia, and what Russia, Russia didn't kill bodies. What did Russia do with the communists? They tried to destroy Amuna. They tried to destroy Amuna. And here, people thought now oh, Putin's going to run over him in, in two days. Zelensky is still going. He's still going. This is Shem. This is Shem. It's not Zelensky. It's not the Ukraine. It's not Putin. It's all Hashem. That's what Hashem is showing us. This is the power of Natila Yadan. What's the power of Natila Yadan right now? Right now, this is our only chance. We can't look what Hashem's doing in Israel. Would tell me another democratic country in the world where a person with 6% of the popular vote becomes prime minister. In Israel, all the other nature, Hashem is saying, look, look, my beloved children, it's me. It's only me. So what I want you to do is strengthen yourself as an amuna. How do you strengthen yourself as an amuna? Take one mitzvah, one mitzvah that is going to strengthen you in Kedusha, and personal holiness and strengthen you in Amuna. You know what that mitzvah is that's going to strengthen us both ways? Both ways? That's Natilis Yadayim. We kill really two tremendous birds with one stone. And I know I don't want to run over time because we've got very wonderful speakers after me. And I, I don't want to take more time than I've been allotted. But I'll tell you one thing. The Torah in last week's Parsha Vayikra, the Torah talks about a korban, a ritual sacrifice called Asham Talui. Asham Talui is a conditional sin. Imagine that a person was a little bit, uh, he had, had too much to drink on Purim and he was hungry. And so he went downtown. And downtown, you've got a black kosher chicken restaurant next to Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he walked in one of those two restaurants and he ate fried chicken. And I'd come out and they say, Where have you been? He says, I went downtown. So what'd you do? A Kentucky Fried Chicken. Where'd you go? He said, Did you go to the, remember, you, you got a receipt to show where you ate? He doesn't know. You don't know, but you was a little drank a little too much. Ah, uh, says what? You mean next door to the Glock Kosher restaurant? There's a Kentucky Fried Chicken. Maybe he ate there. So if this time the base of Migdash, then he's got to do a conditional Corbin because he knew he ate something. But there's one side was treif and one side was kosher, was Glock Kosher. 
So now that's going to protect him, the conditional sin offering, until he finds out, if he finds out that he's got a receipt in his pocket from Kentucky Fried Chicken, oy, oy, oy. now the conditional sin offering is not good. He has to do a, a chataz, a vadai sin offering, a, a certain sin offering. So Rashi says, wait a second. Look how the Torah is so strict on a perchance conditional sin. And the Torah is 500 times stronger on a mitzvah. So if we do a positive mitzvah, like Natilas Yadayim, it's going to be 500 times stronger than a positive sin and thousands of times stronger than this conditional sin that maybe did it, 50% did it, 50% didn't do. You cannot understand the light you bring on yourself and the light that you bring on your family when you do Natilas Yadayim. And I'm going to finish with, uh, finish with two blessings. And these are signed checks. Can't believe this book is Seder Hayom. This book is by Moshe Machir. Moshe Machir was a contemporary of the Arizal. He was a Kabbalist. He was the Rosh Shiva and Ein Zetim, right out at Tzfat. He says like this, Ma'od, 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 One very much has to be careful about Natilis Yadayim. And you know what you get? If you do Natilis Yadayim like you should, and Natilis Yadayim like you should, that's before eating, before eating bread, when you wake up in the morning, right when you wake up in the morning, and this if it really, what could be is uh, this, this lesson could have been four hours to explain all the fast that is done. And after the bathroom or after a shower and before a prayer and a Kohanim, they're not allowed to give a Kohanim blessing without the Tila Zedayim. If you do it properly, for us, that means waking up in the morning, means after the bathroom, and it means uh, before eating. V'yitzlach ma'od b'chol ma'aseyadav a person will be very successful in everything he does, and he will be rich. He will be rich, and he'll have prestige. If that's not enough, Sgulas Yisroel. This was by Rebbe Shabtai Lipshitz, who lived 200 years ago at the time of the Zidat Shavuot, the time the great Rebbeim. He writes like this. He writes about the Sgulas, the powers of the Tilas Yidaim. He says a person does the Tilas Yidaim. You know what's happening now in Russia? In Russia, heaven forbid, they're under siege. They don't have water. He says like this, well, who knows? Says, in the Ukraine, heaven forbid, there could be a war like that anywhere. Could be a war like that in America, could be a war like that in Israel, heaven forbid. Okay. He says, someone that is careful in the Tila you know what a life insurance policy this is? You will never lack water all your life. It doesn't matter. There won't be real rain. There'll be a drought. The whole world will be a drought. You will not lack water, number one. Number two, you'll never lack bread your entire life. Number three, you'll have tivusa. You'll have divine abundance all your life. Cherish sisters. You get riches. You get prestige. You get all the water you want. You get all the parnasa you want. You get your bread. You get divine mercy. Come on. Who's going to turn down such a deal? You have to do it. And, and Bo Hashem, I bless every one of you that you should be zoicha to all these mitzvahs, zoicha to wonderful Purim. And I Blessed that the, the, the whole the whole crew, a Rebbe Senomi and and Orly, but Boch Hashem, Orly and David did want to do. I'm going to invitation to your wedding very soon. Amen. Bezrat Hashem. Amen. Okay, I'm, I'm davening for that. I already started davening for that. Okay, and uh, Boch Hashem, you're more than welcome. You go just very easy to remember laserbeams.com. If you want to see us, we give a, a Zoom lesson every Wednesday night. This Wednesday is Purim, so be resume Wednesday, and I want to bless. Bless the, the whole Irgun, the Tehillim Irgun, and the Tilas Yadayim. It is so amazing what you're doing. Bo Hashem, I'm happy to endorse you. It's on tape right now to endorse everything you're doing. And I'm just so proud of you. And I'm so happy that we have Noshot uh, Chayel. We have such wonderful Benot Yisrael as you. And it's been a privilege to be with you. Rabbi, I have no idea what you, how much you've filled me and how much you've filled all of these women that are on now and those that are going to see it after. The energy. Hashem. Hashem. Wow, what a great job he did. He used you as a conduit for so much strength and kohot. Rabbi, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And uh, for, for your words and for sharing this. What an amazing time for us to even to, to elevate this mitzvah. And just like you said, right? Our hands, everything we touch in our life comes from our hands. So when our hands are purified and sanctified, we infuse that purity and sanctification into everything that we touch. But what made me the happiest from everything you said, what got me beyond excited is, is the connection also to Mashiach. Because 
my own personal life journey ever since I can remember. It's my earliest memory is my yearning to be able to be a part of bringing Mashiach just even a little bit closer. And every, every decision, every project I'm involved in is connected to that. And hearing that coming from you, just it makes me feel so happy. I know Hashem sent me on this path for a reason. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just very, very grateful for your words and for strengthening us. I, I can't wait. I just want to go after this class and eat bread just so I could do Natilat Yadaim with, with such excitement and fervor. So thank you so much, Rabbi. My greatest pleasure, my greatest pleasure. And uh, again, blessings to everyone. It's so, so good to see you. And it was a privilege to be here. I thank Hashem for the privilege of being here. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. We have one, one quick question that came With through. Pleasure. You don't mind uh, that listen, if you want to ask questions, I'm not leaving. If so someone ask... wrote a question here. How can we strengthen our Kihila in Ukraine as well as donating money? Which Tihilim does Rav Brody suggest? Do you suggest specific Tihilim or Tihilim Wait, is this, is this question coming from someone asking for the Ukraine or is it coming directly from the Ukraine? It's coming from somebody asking for. How can asking we strengthen for... the Kihila there? In terms of Tihilim, are there specific uh, types of Tihilim that we should say, or what would you recommend? It depends on the person's situation. If he has, if he's under fire, if he's under fire and people say, oh, I deal with you, I'm he's talking, you know, it's easy for him to talk. Uh, in case people don't know, I live 18 minutes from Gaza in Ashdod. Okay. And uh, we have had a lot of experience in bomb shelters and running back and forth. And sometimes with uh, two grandchildren at each arm, back and forth between over the last, over the last 11 years. Okay, so this is things that really work. First of all, uh, to strengthen yourself, there's a, a physical, spiritual exercise to strengthen. It's something that I adapted from Pilates to Tehillim. Before you say Tehillim, Okay, do deep breaths. Do deep breaths, take 10 deep inhales and explode. So it's a Pilates breather and exhales. Uh, the physical trainers do seven and 11. I like 10 and 10 because 10 is 10 spheres. Okay, you inhale. And you exhale it and you feel that Hashem, ah, Hashem, that's you pumping my lungs. That's you beating my heart. If I would put a stethoscope to my heart, you would hear Yudke Vovke, Yudke Vovke, Yudke Vovke. That's Hashem personally beating the heart. Okay, now say two psalms. Say Yancha of Chaf, and then say after say Yancha, because I'm in trouble. It's in danger. Hashem, you got to hear me times of pressure. And then Psalm 51. Hashem, I don't care what you do. Hashem, don't leave me. You can do anything. You get bombs, this and that. It's a, people go out. It, like nowadays, it's really, it's, it's crazy. You say some woman, you're, you're, crossing the, you're crossing the crosswalk. You've got the right of way. And some woman is text messaging and she's not got, got her eyes on the road and boom, goes through. Heaven forbid. And you see the opposite thing. You see pedestrians, the, the people that have a lot of kifosis around because they can't pick up their Put you walk into the street, put your cell phone in your pocket. All right. They said, think of Hashem, think of Hashem, think of Hashem. And that is what my suggestion to anyone under fire and our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, if you're under fire, think of Hashem. And you have Emuna, and Emuna brings you at Shamayim. And we say every day in Birkata Mazon ki ein machsol of. Okay, won't like anything. Ah, Hashem says, oh, my beloved son, my beloved daughter, you remember me? I'm with you. And when Hashem is with you, not a hair on your head can fall. And look, look what's happening with all the Balagan, with all the attack, with all the everything, all the Ukrainian, the, the, the fatalities, it, everything. I, I don't know how many of them are, are Jewish, or, heaven forbid, but I, I think a small percentage, 1,567 I saw today. 1,500. In Babi Yar, in a matter of a couple hours, at 33,000. Put things in proportion. Put things in proportion. Remember the difference. Can you imagine if someone in Berlin would build a statue to Hitler and say, oh, Hitler did great thing, that Germany was in a, an economic slump, defeat after World War II. Hitler put Germany back on their feet. It would be a scream around the world. 
the Ukrainians, if they, if they wanted to win, I'd tell the Ukrainians, take down the statue of Khmelnytsky. Khmelnytsky in 1648 and 1649, he killed one third of European Jewry. And in Uman, there's a statue of Ivan Gunte. Ivan Gunte, he killed 33,000 Jews in Uman. The reason Rabbi Nahum wanted to be buried there, because not a single Jew bowed down to the cross. Uman, uh, Gunte held up a cross. He says, if anybody bows down to this, they'll be saved. 33, they're not, some of them were illiterate. They were simple Jews. They weren't Tommy de Chachomim. Simple Jews, nobody bowed down. That's their emuna. That's their emuna. And we know the simple Jews that what makes them, what does Shem love them so much? Shem loved them so much. There's never, no, no such thing in Jewish history that a simple Jew wouldn't wash his hands before reading. Mm. And it wasn't like today. He didn't have a faucet. He'd go down to the river and he'd schlep water. And they'd bring it up. They, they worked hard. They worked hard for the Tilas Yadayim. And then the halacha says, okay, we'll, we'll do you a favor. If you are four miles from water, you don't have to walk to water. Okay, you can put the blag on your hand or a glove on your hand and, and eat without. That's a dispensation. That's if you're four miles water. But then because they wash their hands, they always have water. They always have water. It was amazing. I know in the worst, in the worst, even before, before I was religious, when I was a soldier, Shem was showing it. Even it was crazy, crazy being far away from water and always had a a, a canteen from here, a river from here, a spring from there. And especially, especially after a became about well, Chuva 1982, after that, my second war. But you see, Hashem always provides for us. He always provides. That the promise of our Chazal, it's right there. It's money in the bank. But that's the moon. We have to believe in that. We have to Absolutely believe amazing. That. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Rabbi, uh, for your time, for your words of inspiration and chizuk. And uh, Bezrat Hashem, we should all merit through all of the mitzvot that we're going to do. And Bezrat Hashem, focusing on this mitzvah, this incredible mitzvah of Netila, which, which really is connected to Amuna, we should see the Mashiach Titkenu coming. Bezrat Hashem, before, before Besa, we're, we're here, we're ready. We're ready. Amen, amen, amen. And we all should see the Kohanim washing their hands in the base of Megdash be in our days. Amen, amen. amen. God Thank bless you so and much, happy Rabbi. Purim. Thank all you so much, Rabbi. Right, bye bye. Wow, absolutely incredible. Uh, just so super moving. I want to thank the rabbi for his words. I know that so many of you I've seen the comments were touched by his words and have been touched by his work and his writings as well. Uh, as, as you know, there will be a recording. So in case you came on in the middle, not to worry, we're going to be posting up the recording on both the Natila and Abraham's legacy tomorrow. So you'll have the opportunity to re-listen to the rabbi's words in case you missed anything. Each of every word was really, truly uh, just absolutely gold. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Devorah Siso. She, I, she is absolutely incredible. What a powerhouse. And she's going to be also speaking to us. She's an internationally acclaimed Torah educator, a motivational speaker, a life coach, creator of the Breakthrough Series. She was born in Israel and raised in the United States. And she has a gift for connecting with Jews from all walks of life. Her energetic and soulful presentations have inspired literally thousands of people from across the Jewish spectrum, ranging from college students and birthright participants to seminary students, young professionals. And as one of the most popular Jewish female Torah educators, she has been featured many times on Torah Anytime, Hidabrut, H.com, ITV, Nashim Magazine, and so much more. I'm going to be listing all of her links of how you can connect to her as well right here. It's also in the email confirmation that you received so that you can uh, that you can check her out. But without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce you to, to a good friend, just as such a special person, Devora. Thank you so much for being here. Wow. Orly. Orly, I love you. Love I, you too. Know the first time, I want you to know the first time I heard your name was from a friend that told me, have you heard about this woman who just spreads kindness everywhere? She just does so much kindness. Her middle name is Kind. Like, who is that lady? And then I found <laughs> you and I stopped you on the street. <laughs> I love you. Hi, everyone. My name is Devora, and we have 20 minutes to figure out the connection, which was really hard. It took me like five and a half hours. I won't exaggerate. I'm not exaggerating. I mean it today. To find the connection between Purim and Atila Siadai. Thank you, Orly, for that very challenging, exciting treat you set me on. Um, and 
wow, boy, is there a connection. Boy, is there a connection. Now, I, I'm going to introduce, because we have such a short amount of time, I'm going to put on the table a few basic Kabbalistic concepts. Just get them. They're rules of thumb in life. Basic rules of thumb. Okay? Now, I'm assuming that all the women here that have been, that are listening, you're all in this concept of, like, growth and spiritual work. Like, you're aware of the fact that you have a soul, and this world is this world, but there's another world, meaning we're, we're a combination of body and soul. Right? We're all oh, very much aware of that. We also know that when we nourish our soul, when we nourish the parts of us, the internal parts of us, then we feel nicer and calmer and better. And the whole world can be chaotic. Like I just came back from the perm store to buy my kids costumes. Now, don't ever do that to yourself. Okay, there was a line to get into the store and then the line to get out of the store, to pay and get out of the store. The, the layers of chaos, that were going on there, the amount of pushing and shoving and, and, and sweat, and I don't know what else was going on there. I remember myself previously in previous years going there, going to these stores, Arab, Purim, and whatever, and getting so stressed out, like having such high levels of anxiety, just being there, not knowing. And today, it was a, it was a whole different experience for me, because I, I realized at this point in my life, that all I have to do is get on top of my game in certain ways internally, which is what we're going to be learning now. And I could be in every crazy situation and I can stay, I can stay centered. I can stand, I could stay Zen. I don't have to get lost in all the chaos around me. Okay. So what we're learning today is we're going to understand that these rules of thumb that exist in reality in the, in, in the spiritual reality that we're living in, where when a person gets it, that if all they have in life is money, then what's that quote when uh, the, uh, the poorest man is the guy that, and I'm ruining it, but the poorest guy is the guy that only has money, right? When a person, when a person gets fooled by this world to think that it's only the objects or it's only the upgrade or it's only the things that they have that will, well, that will fill them. And then they see that it's, they get it. And then it's like, you know, it's like, it's a facade. Like they get it and all of a sudden it disappears. They get it and all of a sudden it disappears. Like, it doesn't really do that. It doesn't hit the spot. It doesn't fill them, right? It can fill you a little bit and then it's over, right? So, so at this point in our lives, I feel like if we're, on this, if we're on this call together, if we're doing this together, we're all on the same page of I understand, I've been around enough time to understand that it's what's going on internally that's going to determine how I feel in my life. It's what's going on internally, what I invest inside of myself, in myself, that's going to determine how I feel good in my life, in my, either it's my small little apartment or my gigantic house, it doesn't matter. Because I can be in a gigantic house and be ruined inside and be just feeling levels of stress and anxiety and sadness and aloneness that, that, that I don't even see the house. I don't, I don't care about what's going on around me, right? So I, I there's this idea that when I'm focused internally and when I'm calm internally and I'm doing well internally, I'm in watering my garden internally, then that automatically will spill out to everything. And I will find the beauty in my home and I will find the beauty in the perm store where all I want to do is just run away from. I will find the beauty there too. I will find the beauty wherever I go because inside it's beautiful. So what we're learning about now is what we're going to understand this concept, this Kabbalistic concept. I'm going to make it really, really simple. It says here in Parshas Vayeshev, it says that about Yosef, right? It says Yosef was thrown into the pit, and there it says, a borek and bomaim. So Rashi says, a borek and bomaim. The pit is empty, has no water. Why does I have to say it twice? If it's empty, then it doesn't have water, and it doesn't have, I don't know, anything else. It's empty. It's empty, and it doesn't have water. So Rashi there explains, he says, there's no such thing as a vacuum in spirituality. There's no such thing as a vacuum in spirituality. There's no such thing as like, it's empty, and it's just empty. The way it works is like this in spirituality. When there's a vacuum, meaning when there's, a, when there's an emptiness, when there's a hollowness, when there's a halal rik, okay, when there's an, uh, naturally that emptiness has an energy of pulling, the Zohar explains, of shi'iva. It almost like there's, a, there's an energy of, a, of a, like, a, like when the building you know, in Surfside fell, you saw how it fell? Once one part of it fell, the whole thing got, sucked in, into it because there's no such thing because it pulls it in and the idea is when it says a borek en bomaim what it's referring to is our spiritual reality if i'm not full with water and water represents en maim en torah 
what's Torah? There's no water but water, but, but Torah. What does that mean? There's no water but Torah. It means that water is, is symbolic of growth and abundance and life, right? We can't live without water. 70% of our body is full of water, right? We are made up of water. The planet is made up 70% of the planet is water, right? Water is, uh, is the way that all the religions purify themselves. Water is, water is a very, very, very big concept that maybe we can get into another time. But for now, the concept of water is that if there's no water, if there's no life, if there's no growth, if there's no expansion, if there's no pull, pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. And you know what? I don't really want to get up and I'm lazy. And I don't feel like it, but I do it anyway. Because I know that it's good for me. I know that I go into the gym and lifting those weights, even though I don't want to and running on that treadmill, even though I'm tired and just want to be on my couch watching Netflix and leave me alone, right? But in essence, if there's no water, AKA growth, pushing, expanding, trying to move myself in a better direction, even if it's a trial and error, even if I fall, I get up and I fall and I get up and I fall, but I'm in the motion of growth. I'm in the motion of life. Then the water, then the pit's going to be filled with water. But if there's no water, if there's no, there's none of that back and forth. There's none of that. Let me push myself. Let me try. So I failed a million times. Who cares? You know what? I spoke to this lady today that she's trying to stop smoking. She's trying to stop smoking for like so many years she's trying on and off on and off she's like forget it i'm not gonna try anymore i was like no no don't stop don't stop because the act like rabbi nachman explains the act of he says that when you have both your feet in the mud and you try to get one foot out of the mud and then it gets sucked back into the mud you try to get the other foot back out of, out of the mud and then it gets sucked back into the mud and then you get both out and then you fall back in he says every single time you pull your foot out of the mud Okay, you try to stop something or you try to start something, something that's against your grain, something that's not in your habit. Something like, let's say, let's say we don't do it. Let's say we're not mafiran. Let's say we're not thinking about it. Let's say it's whatever. Okay, it's not in our head. When I push myself, I try to get out of the mud. I try to pull my leg out of the mud. And I, you know what? I started today, tomorrow I was inspired. Or I start, I don't know, anything, observing Shabbat or giving tzedakah or whatever it is that I'm doing that's expansive for my soul, that's filling of me, okay? That, that helps me feel, be filled internally. That way my life, it doesn't matter what kind of house, or it doesn't matter really, really, because I'm good inside, I'm full inside. So if I'm, I'm, so he says, Rabbi Nachman, when I start, start doing the process, it doesn't matter if you're still in the mud because the act of coming out of the mud, even though you fall back into the mud, you're already releasing yourself from its grip. It's already not as tight around your leg. It's already, you're already loosened. So it's a matter of trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing like this lady that's smoking and the end she's going to quit and the end it's going to work. That's how it goes. We can't sit inside of our you know, habits and the things that, that are our addictions and the things that are keeping us so small and inside of our own prison, right? And say, I can't come out. I just can't. Even if you don't believe that you will be able to, even if you don't believe that it's going to be a long-term thing, even if you don't believe that you'll be able to keep Shabbat forever or wash your hands forever, or I don't know, get the car forever, by the fact that you do it once, by the fact that you do it twice, that in and of itself creates an inertia. All of a sudden, without, no, without realizing where it's coming from, all of a sudden you want to, all of a sudden you're inspired to, all of a sudden the next job is it's not that hard. All of a sudden, waking up in the morning and washing our hands is not a big deal. Why? Because you've created, you've created an inertia by doing actions in the right direction. Okay, so listen to this, listen to this amazing, amazing concept. The concept is, Rashi says, if it doesn't have water, if a person is not in a state of this, this back and forth, of this, this, you know, this rawness of life, of this trial and error and, and, and succeeding and failing and that whole thing that they're, if a person's not in that, he's not in the game. He says, Rashi, then the, the pit will be full of snakes and scorpions. There's no vacuum in spirituality. It's not like, you know what? I'm not growing. Leave me alone. Let me just sit here and not do anything. I'm fine. I'm, I'm going to stay the same. You can't stay the same because once there's a vacuum in spirit, once there's a hole, once there's an empty space, of I'm not pushing, I'm not trying, I'm not, you know, in the in the in the game. Then what comes in, what he says, are mazikin, are energies that just naturally pull us down without even noticing, without even realizing, without even noticing. I'm, I, it, 
pulling me down, pulling me down in what direction? They create a hunger. These mazikim create a hunger. A person, you know, when you, like sometimes you go to a party or sometimes you go out to whatever and you're talking to someone and they're like, hey, how are you? Hey, yeah, how's your job? Right? They're like, that's hungry. I have this hole inside. I have this emptiness inside. And I, boy, oh boy, do I need to fill it. So I try to fill it with parties, addictions, devices, food, whatever it may be. I'm looking to always fill. So I go from my pantry to my fridge, to my pantry, to my fridge. But you were just in your pantry. Nothing's new. It's the same pantry. I know. But I'm looking for something to fill this thing. There's this hunger. There's this feeling of like, I need something. I need a person. I need a guy. I need a party. I need a drug. I need a TV show. I need to do something. I need a, I'm needing to fill this, this emptiness. So he explains it there. He explains over there. He says like this. He says, if the, if the bow is like, then there's going to be an, a feeling of, of this hungry of, I need to fill myself. And nothing that I'm going to chew on, nothing that I'm going to smoke, nothing that I'm going to party with, nothing that is going to fill me, really. It's going to leave me with that same feeling. So the, the idea is like this. Once there is a halal rik, once there's an empty space, automatically Tilma comes in. Tilma is impurity. When they went to this party, when they went out to this party, according to what we're learning right now, they were in a space... First of all, they were in a space of Gullus, okay? They were in a space of after the first base of Mikdash. They were in Parasumadai. They were in Iran. That's where the whole story takes place. Current story takes place, right? They're in this situation where the king invites them to his house, to his party for 180 days. They're all hyped up. Now, remember, all these people are religious. And now the leader of the generation is like, no, don't go. Mordechai is like, don't go to this thing. You, you can't go to this thing. It's full of Tuma. You Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't. And they're already in the space of, I am hungry. They were like, nah, 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 it's fine, we can go. How can we do that to him? He's the king, it's Chil Hashem. What is he going to think of the Jewish people? We need to represent the Jewish people. We need to go. And, and the leader of the generation is like, no, you don't need to represent nothing. You need to represent God. You don't need to represent anything. You need to stay, you need to stay who you are. Don't go there. By the fact that they went there, their going, their running to the party is, shows us that they were in a spiritual state of hunger. They were in a spiritual state of a borek. Their bow, their pit was empty. Their pit was empty. And when they went to this party of 180 days long, you have to know this party was not a joke. This party was every single taiva that you wanted in the world, you got from sexual to physical to food. They wore, they used the, the begadim of the Kohen Gadol, the clothing of the high priest. They used the kalim of the base of Mikdash. They use the, the vessels from the base of Megadash and the Jews just close their eyes. They close the door. They don't want to see because the level of pleasures and taiva were uh, from the whole spectrum. He called out his wife to come out naked in front of the entire empire. And when she didn't, he chopped off her head. They were, they were murderers. They were, they were drunkards. They were, it says, the Zohar describes the kind of immorality that went on and there it was disgusting what they did there, the levels of sexual impurity that went on at that party is, I don't know if any of us can imagine what went on there. And the Jews went there, but they eat kosher food. The food was kosher because that's what the Yitzhahar does. Yitzhahar is like, but the food is kosher. It's a non-kosher cruise, but the food is kosher. Right? Or, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's fine. Everyone's gonna be Jewish at that thing, right? That's the Yitzhar. Yitzhar, the Jews weren't going to go to that party if they couldn't eat the food, right? But they already told them, Mahadran, glad, kosher, you're good, we got you. Just come, just come. And they were already in such a space of emptiness that they were looking to fill up their empty with what? With akravim v'nachashim. They were looking to fill up their empty. They needed immediately. Once there's, a, once there's an emptiness, once you're not working and building and creating and growing and trying and pushing yourself and in the mode. But remember, it, it's always going to look messy. And that's what Hashem loves. Hashem loves the messiness. He doesn't need perfect beings. If he wanted perfect beings, he would have created us. He would have created more angels. 
millions and trillions of angels. Everyone's perfect. Nobody screws up. We're all good. We're angels. He doesn't want angels. God love language. He loves the rawness of it. He loves the, the, I fell. Oh my God. I can't believe I fell. I can't believe I, I, you know, I, I did the thing that I didn't want to do. I broke. I, after two months, I went back for that drink. After two months, I went back for that cigarette. After whatever it is, I fell. I broke. That's what he loves. And it's the crawling back up again and saying, okay, I'm going to try again. That's what God loves. That's why he put it into the creation when he says, Sheva yipol tzaddik v'kam. A tzaddik is not supposed to not fall. You're supposed to fall because there's something very, very sweet in failure. Something very, very sweet there. Because there's nitzotzot in all the tumah in the world. The Zohar says that in the, in the harshest of veros in the world, there's dusha. Even the pe- people that, that are partake in really bad things, there's nitzotzot of dusha. There's sparks of holiness in, the, in those really bad things that they're doing. So there's good in everything, even in the bad. There's good in everything, even in the bad. And that's what Hashem loves. Hashem loves this whole thing. So what, what are we learning over here? When they came out of that party after 180 days of stooping really low into thick, thick layers of tumah. Now, what is tumah? According to the Zohar, tumah comes from the word of atum. Atum means suck, like shut, tight. Where a person that is involved with tuma, okay, spiritually, he gets shut off. Spiritually, he gets sealed off from kedusha, from feeling. He can literally be in the Kodesh, Kodeshim, and not feel anything. Don't feel anything. Nothing here. Don't feel nothing. Where's the closest bar? I don't feel anything. Right? And it says, it even says after a person goes to the next world after 120, if a person is not, hasn't sensitized themselves in this world to layers of spirituality and of mysticism and of, of, of the beyond, then they'll get to the next world and they won't enjoy anything. And that's in essence what hell is, where they don't get the language. They don't get what everyone's doing. They don't get what everyone's enjoying. They don't get it. They want, they want a cigarette. They want a club. They want a Netflix. They don't get what everyone's involved in over here. So what we're learning is when they came out of this party, they were in such a love, they were in such a place of atum, of being just cut off from anything spiritual, that they were already spiritually dead. Spiritually, they were dead. There were so many nachashim v'akravim, there were so many snakes and scorpions in place of the water, in place of growth, in place of pushing themselves, in place of happiness, in place of growth, in place of all the things that expand us. They went to the opposite extreme that they, when they came out of the party, there were so many layers of tuma that they were already spiritually dead. So what they manifested was extermination of the Jewish people. They were, it was just, it's almost like when Titus went into the base of Mekdash and he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm killing God. I'm putting a sword through the parochet. Look, it's bleeding. Yes, I killed the God of the Jewish people. And a basco comes out from Shemaim and she says, seriously, Titus, bait saruf sarafta. This house was already burnt. The Jews burnt it. They already burnt it. It's already burnt in, in, up above. In Shemaim, it's already done. There's no base of English already in Shemaim. So if there's no base of English in Shemaim, it's just a matter of time before this building is destroyed. You think you destroyed the base of English? The base of English was long the story. You just, you just came to do the job afterwards. You just came to, to you, you know, you're the, you're the, you're the guy that, that cleans up. Same idea. When they came out of the party, they came out of the party, they were, the Jewish people were dead. Spiritually, they were goners. They were dead. And so therefore, Haman said, all right, all Jews to die on the 14th day of Adar. And so what did they do then? They, then Mordechai comes out and then Mordechai says to them, now we fast, right, Esther? Now we fast, now we do tshuva. And they all started for nine for nine. The whole story of Purim took place over a period of nine years, over a period of nine years. The party happened somewhere in the middle, and they started for many years changing their ways, doing tshuva, acts of kindness, uh, fasting, right? Doing, returning things, things that they borrowed, returning it to each other. Not ha- and they went from a place of snakes and scorpions to a place of water, to a place of growth, to a place of expansiveness for the nefesh. <sighs> <sighs> air for our soul because we are our souls we have bodies but we are our souls and when we are in a space of only feeding our body only taking care of our body only nourishing our body only being in the physical world of body 
then the neshama starts to die. It starts to, it's, uh, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I need a mitzvah. I need you to do something that, that, that's going to give me air. The food that you, that the body needs is different than the food that the soul needs. The soul needs you to be a giver. The soul needs you to give tzedakah. The soul needs you to, to not gossip. That gives the soul air, a feeling of aliveness. It's not like if I feel empty inside, let me go buy a Jaguar. Uh, no, uh, it's not gonna work. Let me go get a manicure. You know, those people are like self-love manicure. Self-love, I mean, self-love, it could be defined in many different ways. There's nothing wrong with getting a manicure, but it's not going to really, it's not really gonna like, you know, kick, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not gonna really like hit the spot. It's not gonna hit the spot. Natilati Adaim. Okay, and listen to the connection because it's crazy. Netilat Yadayim is like this, all right? When a person goes to sleep at night, a person has five levels of a soul. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. These are the five levels of the spiritual makeup of our being, of our existence, okay? Now remember, you, I am a soul talking to you right now. It's not the body. It's not the body. You know what this body is? This body is like, is like the shirt, this jacket I'm wearing, okay? The neshama... It, the fact that my sleeves can move right now, it's because my body is moving my sleeves, okay? If I take off my jacket right now, okay, if I take off my jacket right now, right, I took it off, so now it's not, it's not, it can't move its arms. It doesn't have arms to move. It was just a covering for the arms that were moving, right? These are not, now they're, now they're limp. Now they're nothing, right? Because this was what was moving it, even though it looked like before when I was moving my arms, but the jacket was moving. It was the arms that were moving it. Same thing goes, same exact thing goes for our soul and our body. I am a soul talking to you right now. Right now you are experiencing Devora the neshama. Yeah, I have a body. Yeah, it's moving around. But what's the neshama? What's the neshama? The neshama is everything about you, your personality, your charisma, your excitement, your passion, your dreams, your goals, your aspirations, your motivation, your, your, all your baggage as well. It's all your neshama. You are your neshama. You have a casing. That's your covering. So when a person goes to sleep at night, the four, four out of the five parts of them leave their body. They go up to the next world. One part stays, the nefesh. Now, what did we say? We said that there's no vacuum in spirituality. Once the soul leaves the body, immediately what comes in? The snakes and scorpions. Immediately what comes in are the mazikin. The Zohar explains, he says, that when the mazikin come in, when these energies come in at night, when the person wakes up in the morning and he gets back his neshama on all the levels of his neshama, then the mazikin leave the body and all the mazikin only stay on the hands and feet. Now, feet is a different story. Feet is, is like mikvah, hot showers, whatever. That's a different story. Erev Shabbos mikvah, that takes care of the feet thing. But we don't, the, we don't, we're not makfit on the feet situation, okay? Even though there are people that do mikvahs every day because of that. Let's just talk about the hands because the hands is where it's at, okay? The hands because of the fact that we have this halal, this emptiness, when the, when the neshama leaves and it creates a, a, a spiritual emptiness and immediately it gets filled with the mazikin, right? Then they stay on the hands. And the Zohar explains this. He says that when a person washes their hands in the morning, first thing that they do in the morning, first of all, not touching any parts of their, anything, anything, don't touch anything, okay? Because it literally is tuma. It's tuma. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's, if you would have, if we would have spiritual vision, like if I would remove my head for a second and look at my hands with my soul, I would see, to, I would see Tuma, it's like, I would see it. I would see whatever, whatever it is, I would, I would see it. Just like, you know, just like they did this experiment, Dr. Moto did the experiment of the water experiments where he cursed one sample of water, he blessed another sample of water, and then he didn't say anything to the third sample, and he looked at it under under a microscope and the sand, you could watch this on YouTube. It's incredible. Different universities have done amazing research on this idea. But he looked at the sample of water that he spoke positively to and the actual H2O molecule formed in like these beautiful snowflake diamond shapes, like all symmetrical and beautiful. And the water that he cursed came out like, he said like Hitler, he said like all these, you're ugly, I hate you, I wanna kill you, all these bad words. The molecules literally look like deformed. They literally look like, like that, okay? So if we would be able to see our, our hands in the morning and to actually see Toma, there was no way we would touch anything. 
literally there's no way we would touch anything and we would do exactly what Chazal tell us, which is have a border, have a bucket by your bed and have a cut by your bed. And the first thing that you do before you do anything is wash your hands. Don't make a bracha because you still have to go to the bathroom, but just wash your hands. Now I just want to hear, stop for a second. I don't know if you've done this before. I don't know if you, you did this here, but I'm just going to do this for the sake of, you know, teaching the halacha for a second. Did you teach the halacha here? We did. We, oh, no, go ahead. It? Go ahead. You can do it. Go for it. Okay, so listen, ladies. Very simple. This is my junk up. All right. All right. So you fill it up. It has stickers on. It's my kid. You fill it up. You fill it up with your right hand under the water. You pass it to your left hand. Left hand then takes the cup. You have to make sure that your hands are completely dry. The handles are completely dry. Everything is dry because tuma transfers through water. So we don't want it transferring back. Okay. Just remember in the beginning with Corona, everyone was like, <laughs> so it's like that. Okay. Okay. So then, so you fill it up with your right hand, pass it to your left hand. Now you wash your hands until your wrist. So you pour the water down. Okay. It's supposed to be empty. You pour the water down onto your hands and it's supposed to, your hands are supposed to be a little bit open so that it's not closed. So there's no chatita. You want to keep everything open and wash it down to your wrist. Okay. So you do one on each side to remember your, the first hand getting washed is your right hand by your left hand. Okay, you do the right hand all the way to your wrist. You go to your left hand all the way to your wrist. Right, left, right, left. You're done, you did it six times. Some people do eight, but you only have to do six. And then what you have to do is put your right hand, put your elbows inside like this. This is according to the to Shulchan Aruch. This, this is how we do it. You put your elbows inside like this. Remember that every single thing that we do spiritually is creating a, a matzav in the next world. It's creating a, a reality which is going to then be mashpia on us. Okay, so if we do this right, if we do this right, we're going to really affect change in our life. Purity, because this is 100% connected to purity. Okay, so what happens is that you put your hands together, you put your hands together, don't touch, put your elbows inside, one hand is lifted over the left, the right hand is lifted over the left, like you are asking the king for mercy, okay, like that, because what happens when a person does this, is he draws a, an amazing amount of shefa, abundance of bracha into his life, into her life. And a crazy amount. So you do it like this, and then you say, okay? That's how you do it. And then you dry your hands up. And that's how you get rid of the tuna. Now, the idea with Nenat Yadayim is that our neshama leaves and we have a halal. And it says, I want to tell you what it says over here. It says, Kol mazalzel. Anyone that is mazalza, anyone that's a damn, whatever, or takes the cup and like, whatever. Okay? Is cut off from this world. Now, if you think about it, listen to what that means. You're not literally cut off from the world. You're cut off. A person is cut off because if he's in a state of impurity, He's in a state of Maran Bishan. He's in a state of Mazikim. He's in a state of state snakes and scorpions. So he's cut off. He's cut off from, from life. He's cut off from breathing because our breath comes from our actions, comes from our doing, comes from our extensions, comes, comes from our pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones. That's where our, our, our life really comes from. Our happiness comes from. Our joy comes from. That's where our joy comes from. So if a person is not involved in, in acts of purity, naturally, He's going to be ne'ekar min ha'olam. Ne'ekar min ha'olam shelo. Ne'ekar, he's going to be uprooted from life. He's going to, and another thing that it says over here, it says in the Zohar, he says, kol zman sh'adam lo notel yadav b'boker. As long as a person does not wash his hands in the morning, listen to this, nishmato omenet ba'apo, his neshama stays in his nose, ve'ena nikhneset laguf, and doesn't go into the body. Only if he washes his hands. What does that mean that the neshama doesn't go into the gulf? Look how many people we see in, around us uh, that don't wash their hands in the morning and don't do them. They're fine. They're walking around. They have soul. What it means, what the Zohar is trying to tell us is there, there's life, there's living, and there's living. There's living, and there's living. We our, all our sadness, all our frustration, all of our emptiness, all of our uh, in life comes to the fact that we're dying to live. We're, we all want to live, especially Jews. Jews have an extra fire engine that we can't explain. We don't know. 
That's why we're the number one in Hollywood and the banks and everywhere in the world because we have this engine. We have this fire in our tushy. We can't sit still. We have to keep promoting, preparing, doing, growing, changing, affecting, set it up. We, we always have, because that's how we are. We have the piece of the creator inside of us, literally the piece of the creator. So we're always looking to create. So it says that when a person doesn't wash his hands, where it does it, then it keeps the neshama in the body, in the nose, which means the neshama is your engine. It's your fire. It's your passion. It's your life. It's your life force. If a person doesn't wash their hands, if a person's not involved in purity, if a person's not involved in filling his pit up with water, then what will happen is that his life force, his passion, his charisma, who he is, his potential in essence, he can live 120 years and not really know who he ever was because he settled for such a whatever life, doesn't push himself, doesn't challenge himself, lets himself, you know, gives into himself, whatever. I tried dieting today, but I can't do it. So whatever, who cares, right? He gives in to himself. He sells himself sh cheap, short. What happens when a person really, really, really understands that in this work of purity, in, this, in the actions of purity, when I'm involved in purity, even if I get impure and I get pure and I get impure and I get pure, but I'm involved, I'm in the game, I'm in, the, I'm in it, okay? What happens to there? Then he gets a life force. Then he feels his neshama. He feels his potential. He lives his potential. He feels the things and he feels alive. But as long as the person is not washing his hands, as long as the person is not taking off the purity in the morning, impurity, not removing the impure forces from him, his life will be very, 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 very narrow. And his neshama will stay in his nose. His neshama will stay very limited, his life force. He's gonna feel like he's dragging his legs through the mud and another day and another annoying line to stand on. Okay, another Purim, another Pesach. He's not alive. We want to be alive. doesn't matter what you have. doesn't matter how much you have. If you're not alive, you're not even enjoying that stuff. So what's really, really important to understand in this whole connection and with this we're going to end is that the story of Purim, what they were, where they were at, they were in a very, very low level before they even went to the party. Before they even went to the party. After they came out of the party, forget about it. But what happened to them, what they did that was so brilliant and that was so beautiful and that was so wonderful is that they didn't say, forget it, it's too late. Anyway, we're going to be exterminated on the 14th day of Adar. It's too late for us. Forget it. They did it. They cried. They begged. They purified themselves. They gave. They did all the things. They filled up themselves with water, with life. They did all the things that give them life, that breathe life into them. Not just like go through the motions. They did the things. When you do chuba, when you sit there and say, God, I screwed up. Yeah, I screwed up. Yeah, I did that. And I'm really, really, really... Sorry, I did that because I don't want to be that person. I want you to remove that from my slate because I'm going to show you it's going to be different from now on. I'm not going to talk that way. I'm not going to exhibit. I'm not going to express myself that way. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to act like that anymore. You know what that does for you? You know what that does for you internally? You know what happens to you when you're kind? You know what happens to you when you're grateful? You know what happens to you when, you, when you're involved in these energies? <sighs> Life. So when they came out of there, they're like, oh my God, we are so dead. We're literally, we have a, a death date. We are so dead. We need life. Right now we need life. And my Torah. Right now, let's get involved in learning and praying and chuba and kindness and gratitude. Let's get involved fasting, doing all the things that give us, breathe this life back into us. You know why? Because the most amazing thing that God did is that he created, he put into the Bria, he put into the creation, this concept of girlfriend. You don't need to start climbing into your pit and pulling out all the snakes and scorpions, all the like things that you did wrong and all the things that you were running after and all. You don't need to do that, God says. Don't be involved with the bad. Forget the bad. Whatever you did, you did. Do chuva and move on. Don't forget. Don't think about that. Don't be involved there. Keep going. It says like this. All you have to do is turn on the light. Turn on the light. Do not tirate your dime. Smile at someone. You know that Chazal say when you show your teeth, when you show your teeth to someone, you get a mitzvah. Show your teeth. There's a difference between, and there's a difference there. When a person sees your teeth, they automatically they, you, you 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 put a smile on their face. Your face is rishut rabim. It's not rishut yachid. It's for the world. It's not for you. You don't have the right to walk in to walk into people's houses or into stores or down the street looking like it's Tisha B'Av. We do that once a year. So that's it. You don't have a right. Your faith doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the people around you. 
So when we do these things, when we fill ourselves with water, with things that expand us, naturally, we won't be dealing with mazikin. You don't have to deal with the bad that you've done. All you have to do is introduce the good. Introduce the light. A little bit of light pushes away a lot of darkness. And that's the chesed of Hashem. Such a chesed that he does for us all the time. Because he loves the, he loves the fight that we're in. He loves it and he's rooting for us. And when we give up on ourselves, he will poke us and prod us and send us problems and issues and things until we're like, ah, oh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Who do I talk to? What do I got? Things are not working now. Because he's not giving up on you. He's like, I didn't send you to this world so you could just sit up, watch Netflix on your couch and eat bonbons and give up on your dreams and hopes. And because you tried once, twice, I'm going to get up on your face and I'm going to be like, yo, yo, get up, move, 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 move. No, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. Too bad, go. So I'm going to send you this problem and this issue. And now you have to go speak to rabbis and therapists and figure yourself out because you're not happy. And then when the medication doesn't make you happy anymore, it doesn't work on you anymore. What are you going to do now? And when the drugs don't work and the, the drinks are like, you know, kicking you in the rear end, what are you going to do now? Because these things are just getaways from the real work. And the work is introducing the light, introducing the things that really give us as human beings our nourishment. And those are all the things that we said. Purity, levels of purity, connection, love, happiness, joy, all that comes from our expansiveness, our working on ourselves, our pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone. And that's what gives us light. So with that, I want to wish you all a very, very beautiful Purim. And remember Purim, the highest day of the year. It says, there's no, there's, no, there's no distinction between good and bad. There's no dis distinction between the Haman inside of you and the Mordechai inside of you. God is drunk on Purim. He is mad drunk on Purim, which means you and all your sins and all your stuff, you're like, God, forgive me. I want to start over. Give me a new slate. Done. God, I need some money. I need a husband. Over here. <laughs> husband. <laughs> Done. Kwach Purim. Hashem doesn't notice the difference between the Haman and the Mordechai inside of you. He will give you if you stand there like this, but you got to show up and stand there like this. You got to show up and say, this is and this and this and this and this and this. And he says, I'm main. No problem. So Bezrat Hashem, may be this perm and this Pesach. Be the end, the cat, because these are, these are the Chagim of the Geula. These are the Chagim of Geula. And we see the signs of Geula everywhere. We literally see it from the Nebuz. It says everything that's going on right now. Everything that we're living right now, it says, okay? Literally, we, we, we're experiencing it. So Bezrat Hashem, this is our, first of all, Purim is going to come into, into Geula with us. So this is going to be an amazing Purim this year. And Pesach is going to be our last Pesach in Galut. And we are going to greet Mashiach Bezrat Hashem. And remember, that the Mashiach that we're greeting, it's only the Mashiach that we're creating inside of us. How much do you believe in the Mashiach inside of you? How much? The more you believe in the Mashiach inside of you, the more you're going to manifest him physically. How much do you believe in the Mashiach inside of you? Say what you tried a thousand times. Keep going. Keep going. Believe in the Mashiach inside of you. Believe in the warrior inside of you. Believe that you failed a million times. It's only those people that fail a million times that will get far in life because at least they're trying. It's not the people that are sitting on the sidelines. So if you failed a million times, you're in the game. You're doing good. Believe in the Mashiach inside of you. We're going to manifest the Mashiach outside of us. For all of Am Yisrael. Amen, amen. World. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Tavora, Sisu, ladies. Wow, absolutely incredible. Of course, <laughs> as usual, you totally blew my mind. And all of us, we all feel the energy. I feel like a tremendous fire happening. I don't even know what to do with all of it. Thank you so much. What an incredible connection that you came together with this. I absolutely love it. I really absolutely love it. And you, you're talking about just, just a moment ago, you were saying, you know, on Purim, of course, anything that we ask for, it's like Hashem is saying, stamp, done, done, done. It just, you know, continues. Because we know, you know, there's the connection between Kippur and Purim. There's, there's a very strong connection between Kippur and Purim. Kippurim, meaning that Kippur is like Meaning Kippur, Purim is actually, in a sense, on the higher level than, than Kippur Purim is. How? They say that, right, we know that when do we have the Khatima, that Hashem, he ma makes the Khatima for us at the end of uh, Kippur, what do we say? We say, we, we're saying, Gmar Khatima Tova, and that Hashem has sealed, sealed, you know, sealed the book and everything. But where else do we see this Khatima? We also see it in Purim, mm. right? At the end of the Megillah, talks about the Khatima, that he gives over the ring, the concept of the Khatima, 
that really Purim has the ability. It's the one time a year, it's like the, 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 the door opens after Kippur, opens anything that even though we sealed on Kippur, something was sealed on Kippur, you're at the halfway mark right now, we're at the halfway mark. Purim has the ability, it, it's like it's unlocked for, for that time. The book is unlocked and you're able to reverse things that were already chotem on, something that was already sealed because, oh, maybe you didn't exactly, you weren't able to be 100% in there. Maybe you weren't able to forgive people the way that you wanted to be able to forgive them. There was just too much pain around it. Purim has the ability to reverse all that. Mm -hmm. And because we, 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 we get dressed up and we put on these costumes on Purim, it's easier for us to approach people sometimes that it was harder for us to approach during Kippur. It was harder for us to approach them, to ask for forgiveness, to be able to let go of things. We have the ability to do that on Purim. So it's a tremendous opportunity that we have with Purim coming about. And if you think also a connection here, because what's the concept, right, of Kippur, now what Purim is giving this ability to do, it's to ask, it's, a, it's an amazing hug to actually ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness, mm. and to add, to add on to what you said, Vora, forgiveness of others and also forgiveness of ourselves, to stop seeing, like you said, the Nachashim and the Akravim. Because oftentimes, the, 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 the people that we judge most is us. It's so hard for us to forgive ourselves. Purim is that opportunity to do that when things are opened and suddenly you can have a different khatima. could be completely different. So we have the opportunity and the ability to really to turn to people. And that's why we have, right, we have mishloach uh, manot because it's easy to go to somebody. Let's say, for example, there's somebody you haven't spoken to. Maybe there's some sort of, there was some tension. You know, you didn't have a chance to really clear it. But on Purim, everyone's happy, right? Everyone is wearing the costumes. So you, you don't feel as vulnerable to go yourself. You're wearing a costume, right? You're a different person for that day. You're you have the ability to now come to people and you're coming with, a, with Mishloch Mana, you're coming with, in a sense, like a peace offering, which makes it so much easier to be yeah. able to forgive, to let go. Because when we hold on to things, when we hold on, it really actually hurts us on the inside. It, 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 it eats up at us. And yeah. the concept of mine, and you can connect this to Natila, of course, this is for always, but if you're wanting to bring in a mitzvah, the mitzvah of Natila Yadayim into your, into your heart right now during this incredible time of Purim, what a great opportunity it is. You think about it, what does water do? Just like Boris said, right? It's, it's, it's purifying. It's purifying. But also water, when you're pouring from the, it flows. It's a release. And you're pouring it on your hands to let go, let go of the pain, let go of, of, of this aggression that you have towards somebody or that you have towards yourself. Let yes. the waters actually remove this from you. Let it remove it from you so that you, can, that you can embrace others, that you can embrace yourself and to truly be able to be at the highest levels of simcha because that's when we could get to those levels of simcha. When we let go, when we use that water. So I, I, I find there to be such a, such a great connection there with what you were saying. It just, it, you know, um, came to my mind. That I just wanted to share that. But I absolutely love everything that you said. It's so beautiful. Uh, such a powerful message. Thank you so much for being here, Devora. Thank you for the opportunity, Orly. Thank you for all the light you're bringing into this world. We're all oh, conduits and Baruch Hashem, we should continue to be able to be real sinorim. We should really be able to continue to be real conduits to allow the barakah, to allow things to flow through us. Uh, because each and every one of us, every one of you on here is a world in your own. You're absolutely all incredible. We have to just allow ourselves to be that conduit and to believe, to believe that we're worth it because Hashem believes we're worth it. So what are you not believing you're worth it for? It's crazy. So thank you so much, Savora. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank uh, you. And I just wanted to offer anyone that wants to follow, uh, that wants to join, I do a two halachos a day. Yes. Forever, God willing. Two halachos of Shmir Salash on every single day. It's a WhatsApp group. It's like a two, three minute. Um, thank you for thing. bringing that up. We're going to put it here in the chat. Please, guys. It's amazing it's what she does. It's also in the email, the confirmation. Uh, but we put the, we're going to put the, um, the, the WhatsApp group over here for people to join in. Um, yes. for, for, and do you have any, any events coming up that they should know about? Yes. So there's, there's a lot of things coming up. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of things that I'm doing, but I just want to offer you these two WhatsApp groups. I have one WhatsApp group for two halachos of Shmir Salash on a day. It says that a person that learns two halachos every single day, there's a to the next world. So it's two minutes. It's worth it. 
and it's free, it's open for you. And the second thing is a Parsha group, once a week Parsha class. I give like a, a five, 10 minute thing and just an overview of the Parsha, what's going on, just so you walk into Shabbos, like kind of like knowing what Parsha you're up to and what's going on in that Parsha. That's the two things that the two WhatsApp groups. Um, we have, wow, Naomi sent me a whole list of all the things that I, I need to mention, but I forgot. So we're gonna, gonna list it here. here. I'm gonna put oh, it, it's good. in the chat. All of those links are here. So thank you. if anybody Amazing. is not, if anybody is not sure, you can go into the chat. Plus, when I send out the email tomorrow, our thank you email with, with, the, uh, with the recording of this event, I will put all these links as well in case you're not able to rush to write something down. So not to worry thank about you. that. All of them will be there. If you want to get my newsletter or my, my podcast, any of my classes, there's lots and lots of things going on. Uh, we'll make sure uh, to add know. all of it so that you guys yeah. can take advantage and just... Uh, just the, just soak in as much energy from from Devorah. She's absolutely incredible. Uh, thank you, thank so, you much. so much, really. Just uh, so 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 much power. I know that we're a little bit over, guys. So I, I recognize that. I'm going to keep my portion short here, and we're going to go into the Tehillim read, and then we're going to, of course, end with our raffle for a tuna tila cups with the engraving. They're absolutely beautiful. You know, I happen to be, just want to mention something. I happen to be doing, I'm not doing it publicly. I did it well, two years ago in a much more public way. Happened to be in the middle of doing 40 Days at the Kotel. Last Sunday was the two-year anniversary of my Aliyah. And so to, to celebrate that, I decided I want to do 40 Days at the Kotel. I want to incorporate sort of like an everyday thing really to, 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 to lift the connection up because during this, these months right now, from now until Pesach is such an incredible time and such an incredible opportunity for Teshuvah. We can reach different levels than we ever can reach during this, this time right now that we're in. It's been an amazing eight days so far. Tomorrow is going to be, well, tonight already is my ninth day. Mm -hmm. And what I want to, what I want to just mention to you guys, you know, I'm not saying, I know everybody's in different parts of the world right now. Everybody can do 40 days at the Kotel, but the concept of taking something on to do it for a specific amount of time, there are many, many reasons behind it and many reasons to the 40. I'm not going to go into all of that right now. But you have an opportunity, especially hearing what Rabbi Lazer Brody said, what Devorah said about this incredible mitzvah of Yadaim, everything that we shared in the past about Nitzvah Yadaim. You have the ability to take upon this for yourself. You know, when you do something, they say that, you know, a habit is created over a three-week period. So over 21 days, you, could lose, you lose it in three days. Okay, but you, you develop it over 21 days. The reason I say lose in three days, why? Because naturally as people, unfortunately, when we, you know, when we mess up that one time, you know, it gets us down. Then we're like, okay, you know what? I'll do it the next day. And then once we don't do things in a, cons in a consistent basis, we actually get down on ourselves and we, and we give it up altogether. Instead of actually trying and recognizing, okay, we, met, we messed up, just like Devorah said, we messed up. All right, you got to try again. You got to try again. Take that foot out of the mud again. And the next time, the next time. So we have an opportunity from right now until, until Erev Pesach. Perhaps this will be a mitzvah that you really incorporate into your life. And perhaps the classes and the lessons and the, what you've heard tonight will be that, uh, that fire to have you focus tremendously on this incredible mitzvah of Nitzilat Yadayim. Again, like I said, I, I, would, I have so much that I can share about this, but I don't want us to go too much over. But what I will share with you, and hopefully we'll discuss more at uh, upcoming events, on the website, Okay, on the Nitila website, if you go to nitila.com, you have the ability to see here loads of resources, okay, in terms of the history behind Nitila Yadaim. Actually, I'm going to make sure I incorporate some of the sources that the rabbi shared. They were absolutely incredible, as well as why copper, the concept of why copper on a, on a spiritual level and also on a, on a, a health level. One of the things that, I, that I've shared with you before, but again, you can look all into this in more depth, and it also discusses the proper way to do Nitilat Yadayim like Devorah shared. The one thing I'll add on to what Devorah shared is if possible, when you're making the, the when you're doing Nitilat Yadayim, in addition to, of course, washing first on your right, you know, it's best that when you're passing, if you need to pass from your left to your right, you put the cup down and then you pick it back up with your right. That you, can, that you can pass from right to left, but if you're passing from left to right, put it down first and then pick it back up with your right. All of the instructions are also on the website so that you can see them. One other thing that's listed there, and, I'm, and, and then I'm gonna just share one more thing and we're gonna go into the Tihilim reading. There's an incredible video that I posted up on the, on the Tila website. Perhaps I'll share it in the, uh, in the email tomorrow. And it talks about, you know, Devorah, you were sharing 
right? If imagine if we had these, you know, we were able to see, spiritually see, we would see the tum'ah, right? That's on our hands. Like we would see it. Like we physically actually see it. Well, there's an incredible video that shows the opposite, that shows that when we're engaging in mitzvot, the aura around us changes. It's been able to be measured scientifically. You can see the aura around a person change. It shows it when a person is doing a talia daim or they're putting on tefillin or they're saying tehillim, they're engaging in, in uh, good, good deeds. There is an ability to actually measure the aura around the person. This is incredible. Uh, I'm going to make sure to share that video. Perhaps I'll share it tomorrow in, in, the, in the thank you email. It's really something special to see. We don't realize the impacts of our actions because we don't necessarily see them. We don't have those, those goggles yet. Hashem sees them. Bezrat Hashem, when Mashiach comes in another day, you know, we're going to be able to see them too. You know? But we don't realize the impact of what we do. The things that we do, the mitzvot that we do for ourselves, and it's what that we do for other people. It's, it's tremendous. It's like picking up diamonds every time we have the opportunity to do something. So I want to encourage all of us. To let's try and pick up as many diamonds as possible. And perhaps it'll, be, it'll start with the mitzvah that's for you. Perhaps it'll start with the mitzvah and the dime that brings into our lives abundance, spiritual abundance, physical abundance, wealth and health and fertility. All of these things are connected to mitzvah and the dime. And going a step further, just to speak about the concept of copper for just a moment. The concept of copper of Nehoshet, you know, R Rabbi Brody was talking about it. He said, right, the mitzvah was originally given to Moshe for Avodah and the Mishkan of the Kohanim. That was when the mitzvah was given. And what did Hashem say? He didn't say, do me a favor, make a, you know, kior of uh, gold or of silver. No. He said, make it of Nehoshet. Make it of copper. Shlomo Melech. Yam Shalomo, where also the Kwanim would dip into, what was it made of? Nechoshet. It was made out of copper. The, the Nechash Nechoshet, right, that Moshe made, and he lifted up. We were talking about the idea of the hands, right? The rabbi was talking, the rabbi Endavor was talking about the idea of like lifting our hands and what that does. When he lifted it up, what was the Nechash made of? When there was a Magifa and the people had to see it, and when they saw it, they were healed, it was made out of copper. There's a tremendous healing power to copper because copper acts as a natural antibacterial. When the water comes through the copper, the waters that touch our hand are 100% are pure because copper, nechoshet, acts like a force field. It's a force field. Tum'a clings to anything alive. And you said it, Devor, right? Why to make it dry? Because we know that Tuma clings to anything alive. And what is Maim? Maim is Maim Chaim. It is alive. So Tuma can cling to it. Copper is very specific why it's connected to water in so many places in Torah. Because it acts like a force field, that it's impenetrable. So when the waters touch the raw copper, it's as though there's a force field that's not allowing Tuma to penetrate it. So when we pour it onto our hands, we're pouring pure waters onto our hands. This is incredible if we come to realize it, that everything that we do in our life has to do with the kavanah that we bring into it. What is our intention? What are we thinking when we're doing this mitzvah? Are we doing it just uh, like, like the Bora was saying? Or are we really putting that intention and understanding and taking the time and lifting our hands and bringing this intention to our minds as we're saying the beracha? what it could do for us, it's crazy. But if we think that it's our arms, our hands that are winning all these battles, it's not. Where are we rushing to? We're rushing to get to the meeting, to the thing, to the other. Hashem is the one in charge. He's driving the bus. If we do the things properly, my goodness, the barachot that he could bring into our lives, that's why he gave it to us. And it's a very, very, very big reason is why when my cousin approached me about this, talking to me about this concept of Natila and saying, we want, I want to help bring a piece of the Beit HaMikdash into people's house. I said, are you serious? I'm in. Of course I want to do that. To be able to bring a piece of the Beit HaMikdash into people's house, to bring this concept of Nechoshet, of course we have to do it. So we're going to be doing our raffle. I will tell you, okay, just to mention to you, because it's important, that the, the, uh, the Natla Nechoshet that we have here is raw copper on the inside. And maybe you have another copper cup. That's fantastic. You don't need to have this copper cup. But the nechoshet here has to be raw. Why has to be raw and not, uh, and not coated? Because the raw copper needs to touch the water for this amazing magical combination to happen. It's 
got to be raw. What we know about raw copper is that we'll tarnish. So people ask, oh, orderly, it's tarnishing it. That's fine. The more that it's okay. It's supposed to tarnish. If it didn't, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be 100% copper. It wouldn't be the raw copper. But it's easy to clean it. They say that they compare Am Yisrael to copper. Why? Because it's easy, easily tarnishes, right? We, can, we sometimes get uh, dirty with our averot, with, uh, with, our, with our sins that we do, but we're very easy to clean, just like copper. You take a piece of lemon, you dip it into some salt, you rub it, and it looks good as new. But just understand that each one, each of these cups, there might be different look of the cup 100% because why? This is, this is raw copper. So just to explain to you, in case you do get a cup, to understand how to care for the cup, because this is... It's not just a, something, you know, beautiful to put in your house. This is a spiritual vessel. Your Natila cup is a spiritual vessel. And what you invest into your vessel, how you invest in doing it, is going gonna, is gonna to speak volumes about what you're able to bring into your life. So wow. I, I, I hope for all of us that we're able to elevate this mitzvah, elevate and take the words that we've heard here, absolutely beautiful words by Rabbi and by Devorah. Wow, what incredible words and infuse it into our lives. Okay, we're going to do our, our, our uh, Tehillim read. I do apologize for the delays. We have our six-minute read for those of you. I see Cheryl, you're on. I, it's so good to see you. And so if you don't have the app, you can download it. It's Abraham's Legacy on the App Store. It's a completely free app. And I'm going to share a quick one-minute video. Right after the one-minute video, it's going to show you how to download it in case you don't have it. It's going to explain to you what we're going to do. We have a six minute countdown clock with our beautiful music that we're going to hear. And at the same time, each of us are going to click to start read and we're all going to get different chapters in the global count. We have over almost 14,000 people right now on the, uh, that are on the app. We have 14,000 people that have the app. So let's read this together. And Bezrat Hashem will finish a book in these six minutes. Don't go anywhere because we're going to do the raffle right after that. Here we go. On behalf of Abraham's legacy, we are excited to lead you in a Tehillim reading where each and every one of us from wherever we are in the world can easily join in and complete a book of Tehillim in unison within minutes through a very special app called Abraham's Legacy, Tehillim Together, in memory of Avraham ben Polin. To be part of the global Tehillim read happening now, download Abraham's Legacy on your mobile device from the App Store, available for iOS and Android. You can also scan this QR code with your phone to scan a QR code, simply open the camera on your phone and hold it up to this image. A link will appear on top, which you can click and it will direct you to download the app. I'll give you all a moment to download the app. Sign in. And in a minute, we will all click on the Start Reading button on the main screen, and each of us will receive a different peric from the Sefer of Tehillim so that we can complete the book and add to the global count. In the top right corner, you can click the icon to switch your language if you like. You'll also be able to see in real time the amount of people reading and countries reading. Don't forget, you'll need to confirm that you've completed the chapter. Let's put a few minutes on the clock to read in unison so that we can unleash the power of our combined tefillah. Tiskula Mitzvot. Le 
לך קראנו בלילות, ועוד נצעק ברחובות, רחם עלינו הבא, הושיענו, הושיענו. זמן עובר כולם את פעמיו, רוצה הכל עכשיו. שמש בשמיים אפורים, עם בארץ אבותיו, נלחם עוד על חייו. בגוף עייף לי כישלונות, בלב שבור לחתיכות. נחכה לך שתקבל פנינו. בגוף עייף מכישלונות, בלב שבור לחתיכות, נחכה לך שתקבל פנינו. לך קראנו בלילות, ועוד נצעק ברחובות, רחם עלינו הבא הושיענו. הגיע הזמן להתעורר, לעזוב הכל, להתגבר, לשוב הביתה, לא לחפש מקום אחר. הגיע הזמן להשתנות. גם אם פספסנו תחנות, אפשר לרדת, יש רכבת, חזרה אל השכונות. הכל אפשר רק אם נרצה, המחפש תמיד מוצא, גם אם הוא נמצא, אישה מרחק בקצה. דתות שמיים לא ננעלו, כשהבן קורא אצילו, אבא שבשמיים, מה הגיע אפילו? אפילו שעשינו משהו רע. הוא מוחל וסולח, מוחל וסולח, מושיט ידו לעזרה, ונותן ברחמיו את הכוח לתקן, ולשוב אליו. ברוח אז מאחד, אם כבר לקחת, אז לקחת בשביל לתת. וזה הזמן להתקרב, לא לפחד מהכאב, ואם לתת, אז כבר לתת מכל הלב. הכל אפשר רק אם נרצה, המחפש תמיד מוצא, גם אם הוא נמצא אי שם הרחק בקצה. דתות שמיים לא ננעלו, כשהבן קורא אציל. אבא שבשמיים מגיע אפילו, אפילו שעשינו משהו רע. הוא מוחל וסולח, מוחל וסולח, מושיט ידו לעזרה, ונותן ברחמיו את הכוח לתקן, ולשוב אליו. אפילו שעשינו משהו רע, הוא מוחל וסולח. מושיט ידו לעזרה ונותן ברחמיו את הכוח לתקן ולשוב אליו And you can go ahead and you can finish the, the perek that you're on. We finished one book together. 
we finished up one book and somewhere in the middle, with all together, we were about six countries that were reading with us and about 26 people at the same time. Absolutely beautiful. For those of you that don't know about Abraham's Legacy app, I highly encourage you to check it out. My hopes and my goals for this are really tremendous. And I, I pray that Hashem give me the ability to be able to continue to build it out. Actually, Natila, you should know that when you purchase a Natila cup, and I'm going to let you guys know that if, for those of you that may not win the cup, if you want to get your cup, we have a coupon code. And when you purchase the Natila cup, proceeds from it go towards helping continue to build out uh, the Abraham's Legacy app. So they're very, very, very much connected. Um, you can, if you, are, if you go to natila.com, you can get your cup, whether for yourself, for a friend, for a family member, whatever it may be. Uh, we also have engraving for the cups, which is absolutely beautiful. The two cups that we're going to be raffling off tonight are with engraving and they have the bracha beautifully. The bracha netilai daim, I wish I had it here to show you guys, but they're gorgeous. I'm going to send a picture in the email tomorrow so you could see what it looks like. It's really absolutely gorgeous. If you use the coupon code PURIM, P-U-R-I-M, very easy, PURIM, you receive a 10% discount on the cup. And this is going to be, you have the opportunity to get it at a, at a even lower price now before the Chagim it's going to be going up until next Sunday. So you have until March 20th in order to do that. Uh, in addition, just so that you know, through Abraham's legacy, through the app, you have the opportunity to dedicate a chapter of Tehillim in honor or memory of a loved one. And when you dedicate a chapter, their name will be on a specific pedic for the week or for the month. And we have hundreds of books being completed on a weekly basis. That's a huge, huge zahut. You could check that out directly on the app and I will post the links over here as well uh, in the chat so you can see how you can go about doing that. Uh, I wanna thank you all so much. We're going to do the raffle, not to worry, we're gonna do the raffle, so stay tuned here. I'm gonna share my screen and we are going to uh, pull up our wheel of names over here. Here it is. And we're going to be doing our two prizes. Now, if you win, I'm gonna send you an email, so not to worry, you'll send me your address so that I can get the Nitila cup to you just as soon as possible. Uh, so you have the opportunity to make this Hidur Mitzvah. Here we go. And the winner for the first cup is, and it's spinning, let's see what we got here. We have a lot of names here, let's see who is it. And it's Tanya Freeman, Mazal Tov. And we have one more that we're gonna spin and we spin the wheel. And our second winner for the engraved Natila cup is Mazal Mataye. Mazal Tov and Mabruk, so excited that you won. Again, like I said, I will send you an email so that you can send me your address and I'll make sure that I get this to you directly. I wanna thank all of you for joining. We are going to be having, just so that you know, additional events coming up. There is an event that I'm part of with a whole group of women that's going to be happening starting, if I'm not mistaken, March 27th. I'm going to be presenting on March 31st. I'm going to be speaking mainly about kindness, about the other work I do with uh, my nonprofit Life Fest inside, but I'll make sure that I do send an email out so you can see the full schedule and the agenda and so that you can register for my, either my talk or any of the other speakers. There are incredible speakers. Naomi just put the link in the chat. It's powerupforpesach.com. That's how you can find out more, powerupforpesach.com. I'll make sure to include it in the email that goes out tomorrow with the recording. Feel free to share the recording with, with family, with friends that you feel that will really enjoy and really take from this. I wanna just open an opportunity for anybody that would like to ask any questions. I'm gonna close the, the Facebook Live and then if you'd like to stay on, feel free to ask any questions. But I wanna thank all of you for being here. And let's remember, let's remember, tefillah, tefillah changes us. And when we change, our world changes, huge thing. Thank you all so much. Purim Sameach, and I'm Bezrat Hashem looking forward to welcoming you here, seeing you here by the Beit HaMikdash very soon. I thank you to our speakers for an incredible job. Take care and have a great night.